Uh, yeah, I am Apti. I work on Solium. And the goal of this talk is to socialize our process to rethink uh, BPF contract. So I'll, I'll be using Solium contract implementation as for reference, uh, but some of the fundamental uh, design factors uh, may vibe with you all. So here is how I've uh, organized the talk. Uh, we look at some of the uh, context for Cilium contract, and this will set the stage for the, uh, the problems that we are facing and some of the solutions that we have been exploring. And in the end, we'll have time for discussion around what works, what doesn't, uh, while using existing kernel constructs. So uh, Cilium has a native contract uh, implementation. Uh, it's, it's used for load balancing and policy enforcement where we track flows based on, on the five tuple that we see in the packet. And it uses a BPF LRU map to store this information. Uh, the nice thing about this implementation is that it enables uh, easy data sharing between Cilium uh, TC and XDB programs. So uh, let's go a level deeper. So what essentially Cilium does uh, while tracking connections is on the egress path, so when a, an application is sending out traffic, uh, it keeps track of uh, this flow to know whether a packet belongs to an existing flow. And depending on that, it does uh, Kubernetes service load balancing. So Kubernetes has this service abstraction where uh, service uh, has a VIP IP address that's backed by uh, service backend uh, IP addresses. And these uh, backend IP addresses can come and go, uh, but the application can continue to connect to the VIP. And Cilium load balances it in uh, behind the scenes. On the in ingress side, uh, we tr uh, Cilium tracks packet replies. So this is to mainly to know whether a packet uh, belongs to an existing, a packet, reply, a packet is a reply to an existing flow. And then uh, it does the reverse translation where it will translate the service backend IP address back to the original service VIP. And uh, in addition, it also does uh, uses this information for policy enforcement. So if pod A is allowed to connect to pod B, then pod B uh, replies are, are allowed by default. So let's look at how uh, Cilium tracks connections. Uh, with the packet path. So here we have a client pod on the left, which is connecting to a service VIP. So the call client 1111 is connecting to service VIP 2222. And Cilium uh, looks this IP address. It finds that it's a service VIP. Uh, it will select a, one of the backends for this service. And it will create a contract entry that I've highlighted in blue. As you can see, uh, I've dumped, uh, I've added a snippet of a contract table on node A, where this client pod is located. And as you can see, the source IP is the client IP address, which is the 1111. Uh, the destination IP address is the service VIP, 2222. And this is a service type uh, contract entry. And what it tells is that Cilium has selected a backend for this connection, which is the 1112. Uh, and this backend uh, is deployed on a remote node, uh, node B, in this case. So the third step is that it will do the uh, destination translation. Uh, it will translate the service VIP from 2222 to the selected backend IP address, which is 1112. All right, so continuing the packet path, uh, the third step is it will do the destination translation. And correspondingly, it will create an egress entry, which I've uh, highlighted in orange, uh, which says that there is an egress flow uh, where the source IP is 1111. It's connecting to the backend IP address, which is the 1112. And uh, yeah, so this will be used to track the packet replies uh, from in the Nginx backend back to client. So continuing on the packet path, let's look at the reply path. 
So on the reply, uh, Nginx backend pod on node B replies back to client, uh, which is the 1112, uh, going back to 1111. And now this reply will match the egress entry, contract entry that Salim created on the forward path, so which is the second entry that we see uh, on the contract table. And what it says is that the destination address needs to be reverse translated back to the original service IP address that the client was connecting to. So it will do the reverse translation from 1112 to the service width, which is 2222. And then finally, this packet will be handed over to uh, the client pod. So that's how the uh, connection tracking works uh, in Selim. Uh, so as you can see for this, uh, it has created two entries. One is to track uh, the client talking to the service IP. So all the subsequent packets in this flow will select the same backend that was selected uh, originally. And the second flow is meant to match the replies uh, so that we can do the reverse uh, destination uh, DNAT. So next we can look at, we'll look at the uh, lifecycle management. Uh, so great, Salim has created these entries in the LRU map. Uh, how are these entries managed? So these entries, uh, when it creates a contract entry, it selects a default timeout because it doesn't know when this connection is going to uh, get closed. So it, it selects a reasonable timeout, uh, which we kind of map uh, match to how Linux kernel, uh, the Linux kernel defaults. And then uh, these timeouts are refreshed on every time uh, it sees packet for, for a particular flow. And uh, we set long timeouts because uh, this is to allow long-lived connections. Uh, uh, it's, it's possible that uh, client A is talking to client B, that there, there isn't a pack and send for a long time. We don't want to prematurely delete this contract entry because the next time the client sends a packet, uh, a new backend will be selected and this will reset the TCP connection. So, um, uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, uh, this is Martin. Uh, I have a quick question on. Oh, no. Your last slide, can you go back to your previous slide? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is this the slide you so are looking at? It's the TCP socket you are talking, we are talking about here. Yes. TCP connection. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible, like, um, let's say for the egress part, one, one, <coughs> one, one, dot, one, dot, one, trying to connect to one, dot, one, dot, one, dot, um, are trying to connect to 2.2.2.2, right? And then the TC program is trying to rewrite to 1.1.1.2. So instead of like inserting an entry to the uh, hash table or LRU map, um, is it possible you can store something in the socket local storage in, in the client socket? So yeah, can uh, hold your thought. Part? I am coming to it. Yeah, hold, okay. hold your thought there. Yeah. I have a question since we're here. Sure. Um, there's two F zeros. Maybe I don't really understand how Kubernetes work, but like, is Node A and Node B on two different machines? Is is the big F zero? Is that a, is that a physical? Is that is yeah, that the physical exactly. NIC? Uh, so but then the F zero inside the node is some kind of virtual. So the LXC zero is the virtual interface for the container. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the Vth peer on the host network side, uh, okay. host network namespace. And the ETH zero that you see on the node is the physical network the interface. Physical. OK, thanks. All right, so uh, yeah. So entries are created with default timeouts. And then uh, there is an asynchronous uh, mechanism for expir actually expiring these entries. So there is an user space agent that runs periodically. Uh, and uh, it goes ahead and deletes the expired entries. And there is an adaptive interval uh, that we set. Uh, so uh, let's look at what, what problems we see with this uh, implementation. So uh, the out-of-band garbage collection uh, is, is, is quite complex because uh, it needs to keep this balance between it doesn't, uh, it can't run too frequently, otherwise it will 
uh, drive CPU usage uh, on a node. At the same time, uh, it cannot go, uh, it cannot let too many entries in the map that are already expired. So because entries are not expired until GC happens, we sometimes have this uh, contract entry reuse on tuple collision. So users have often uh, reported problems where they uh, mentioned that uh, because of this the contract entry reuse, uh, there, is, uh, there is an unbalanced uh, or rather skewed service uh, backend selection. So what ends up happening is uh, there is an expired entry in, in the contract map. It hasn't been uh, removed yet. Uh, but when the client sends another, starts another connection, it and there is a reuse of source port, the five tuple matches with these uh, existing contract entries, um, and then uh, it ends up using the same backend that was previously selected for some other uh, connection that happened in the past. So uh, the reason we have these sticky entries is we want to select the same consistent backend for a flow. Uh, but then it ends up having this issue where uh, load balancing decision happens uh, based on the contract state, and since that state is stale, uh, uh, it, even if you, even if users uh, spawns let's say new backends, those backends are not selected until this until these stale contract entries are deleted. And finally, we have uh, we have uh, noticed this. Uh, BPF LRU map insertion failures that typically uh, seem to have uh, seem to happen at high packet rates, uh, but this is out of out of the scope of this uh, talk. So we will focus on uh, the other issues that uh, that we see here. So what are some of the areas of improvements? Uh, A, we want to make load balancing decisions based on per socket state. Uh, so yeah, socket storage uh, seems like a logical kernel construct that you can use to save flow state. And uh, more importantly, uh, we can do garbage collection in BPF. So one of the low-hanging fruits is uh, just use a map iterator to iterate over the uh, entire map and then go on expiring entries. Uh, but this still has the problem where we have to come up with a clever uh, interval that will strike the balance between uh, keeping the usage, uh, CPU usage down uh, and at the same time keeping the map usage uh, to minimal. Uh, but there, there is a better option available, uh, which is tying in contract entries to their corresponding socket cycles. So. Uh, we can keep track of when sockets are going away and then clean up entries associated with those sockets. So let's look at uh, socket storage, uh, which is a construct that was added in kernel 5.2. Uh, here are some nice properties about the socket storage uh, option. It lets you, as the name suggests, uh, it lets you save uh, state at the per socket level. So we can use this to uh, save our load balancing decisions. Uh, it's delegated and handled by kernel, so we don't have to uh, concern ourselves with coming up with like how to size uh, an LRU map or, or other, how to size a hash map or use LRU map for that matter. And uh, one of the attractive properties is automatic GC. So when a socket goes away, uh, its socket storage is automatically cleaned up by the kernel. Uh, on the flip side, uh, there are some uh, th there are some issues with the uh, with using socket storage as is. So, on the request path, as we can see, we can save state in the socket storage and look that up. Uh, on the reply path, as uh, although we have to do socket lookups to retrieve storage. And it, this needs, uh, the API needs network namespaces, which means we'll have to do extra bookkeeping uh, in containerized environments. Uh, additionally, the, the socket lookup a, uh, API on ingress doesn't work for us because we do DNAT uh, when we translate address from service to backend. Uh, and if we pass this tuple to the socket lookup API, uh, it won't uh, match any of the sockets. 
So this doesn't work for the load balancing use case that we have. And finally, uh, this, is, this is a minor issue uh, on this path, uh, or other, it's in the context of this uh, talk. Uh, but we have some, some Cilium subsystems that kind of piggyback on contract GC and check, hey, is this connection active? And if it's not, then uh, it'll do some its own cleanup. So we, we don't seem to have uh, this like easy map iteration capability for uh, socket storage. So, uh, but yeah, looking at the nice properties, uh, can, we, can we use uh, socket storage to replace Cilium LRU map? Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, not quite so. Uh, but let's look at how we can use those properties to make uh, contract GC more efficient. So, uh, yeah, so as the socket storage uh, allows you to store some data, uh, we can cache uh, Cilium uh, socket, uh, excuse me, contract entries that Cilium creates. And uh, this will be used for easy lookups, uh, and we will take, uh, we will take a closer look at this when I uh, talk about the POC in just a minute. And finally, as we, talk, as we have been talking about fate sharing, uh, hook into socket storage delete events so that we can expire uh, contract entries that are associated with, uh, with a socket that's going away. So uh, here is how we can uh, make use of socket storage uh, for better, for coming up with like better efficient GC. Uh, just for POC purposes, uh, I created this FNG BPF program uh, on BPF SK storage uh, free helper. So when Cilium creates uh, contract entries, we cache these entries, the entry keys rather, uh, in the socket storage. And uh, we previously saw that th these were the service and egress entries that Cilium, con uh, Cilium creates. We look up these contract entries uh, when, when, uh, when the F entry programs are executed. So a socket is going away, we look up, the, uh, we look up in the, uh, the storage cache and delete the, the entries from the contract map. So let's look at how uh, it all plays out. So as you can see, this is the F entry uh, 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 program that's executed on BPF SK storage free. Uh, as a first step, we'll uh, use BPF SK storage get to look up uh, if, if there were any contract entries stored for, for this socket. If there are, then uh, we go ahead and delete those uh, entries. So does this work? No, there is a twist. So this is not allowed uh, from BPF SK storage free. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, as you can see here, this program doesn't load. Uh, uh, there seems to be uh, additional checks in the kernel where it doesn't allow you to, it, it, it prevents like self-referential kind of loops uh, in, this, in this path. So you are not allowed to call SK storage get uh, from SK storage free. So this brings me to uh, the discussion. Uh, what's, I, I suppose it makes sense to disallow uh, calling this helper from F exit because the storage has been deleted. So it doesn't make sense for users to call this helper uh, on F exit. Uh, but what's, what's the context for not allowing this in the F entry path? And whether this limitation can be lifted uh, the alternative for us is going back here. If we can't look up uh, the cache, then we'll have to just iterate over the map and then try to see, try try to match socket uh, IP addresses in in contract entries uh, and delete those entries uh, in this uh, F entry program. It's just not efficient, and it 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 kind of. Uh, prevents us from using the full potential of socket storage. So yeah, that's all I had. Happy to take any questions or? Um, Martin, do you happen to, to know whether, 
what could be a potential issue? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been a while. So um, I think it was not allowed. It. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool. So uh, it was. I think it was not allowed because the SP storage gap can also create an entry, create a local storage at the socket itself, right? So uh, it's definitely will be a bad idea if we allow to recreate the entry when we're trying to free the socket. So I think that was the um, <coughs> primary reason that why we cannot uh, do socket lo local storage gap doing when the when we're trying to, when we're freeing freeing the uh, as uh, storage itself. Uh, but I think let's step out a little bit. I think my understanding is we want to have a like a uh, to be able to like delete something from a map. It doesn't have to be LL map, but any hash map where right, when some event happened, um, the event that we want to track is this socket is going away. Um, but if we, if we step out a little bit more, um, the pro I think the problem. It's more like we have a kernel uh, a socket hash table already. Uh, it's, for TCP, it's going to be a INET hash info, right? If I remember correctly. But that table is that table is uh, keyed by a four tuple, which has the source and destination IP address, and the destination IP address is not the one that you are looking for here. So I feel like we pretty much want a, another hash table that has a, uh, I don't know, uh, the, the four, four, four tuple that you have with the destination, destination address that, <coughs> that you want. But the, but the value, it could be like a, uh, a K pointer. The K pointer is the socket that, that you want to store in there. So I think what I'm saying is, it, Maybe you can think of like um, think you you can change the problem a little bit instead of using because because tracing the SK storage free and then and then use this hook to to trigger a delete in the in the LRU map it feels like a a hack to me to 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 try to achieve that so maybe doing it in a more clean way could be. Have yeah, a hash the table. It could be a, it could be a BPF map, right? And then the BPF map could have the four tuple that you wanted, and then the value could be the K pointer that store the socket that you want to track. So the tracing uh, is just mm -hmm. meant for POC. Uh, what what I would propose is that we have mm -hmm. some kind of callback that we can register with socket storage, uh, maybe using like struct tops or something similar. And then uh, in the callback, we do the same thing that we are doing here in, in the F entry program. And right. uh, going back to your comment about storing <laughs> these tuples in a separate map, uh, it kind of brings us to the original problem, one of the problems that I mentioned. Then we would have to come up with the map size. And that, that's kind of tricky. Yeah, the map side. Yeah, so uh, can you use this? As I've added a while ago because we were doing SNAT, not DNAT, but I've added a like INET socket close hook, which is, I don't know, you can clean it up from this place, and it's guaranteed to run from everywhere. Sure, but in that case, we'll have to iterate over the map to find all the related entries. I think you can also look up socket storage from that socket and then do whatever you do here basically from a different hook. So are you suggesting hooking into INET socket close events? Yeah, 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 you have a socket. You can look up socket storage, find all those entries, and mm. remove it. Yeah, I agree. It might be okay. a better solution. But the downside is if you don't use it for specific sockets, you do the lookup. But yeah, I agree could be worth an option. Yeah, I suppose we will get notifications on all 
the sockets and not just for the oh, no, sockets yeah. that we created yeah. so, uh, storage yeah. for. But I, I think the circuit storage gets is relatively cheap if it's not there, right? It's just look, if there's a pointer, it's like nothing. And I don't think there's a lot of overhead of this. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's an option. Uh, Martin, I had a comment on your original. When you mentioned the context for not allowing this, I suppose you create storage only when you when when a user passes the BPF create flag. Is that not the case? Yeah, that's true. That's the. Yeah. So can we yeah. look for that flag and then only then disallow this helper being called? Maybe that I'm not hundred percent sure. I need to go back to look. Yeah. But go back a little bit on my other suggestion. Is it the size, the table size is the is the is the only blocker? Let's say if we want, if we can store the, if we can create BPF map to, to store the socket pointer as the value, is it the static map side the only broker? So what would be the key uh, of, for that map? Maybe I missed that part. Whatever key you define, I think in your case it's the four total. You define it here. But we already have that in, in our contract LRU map, so how, how is that different? So, so just a side comment. I, I, the map size problem isn't that created by the fact that you have no way good way to clear the map empty the map that there is an upper bound on the number of sockets in the system right you, you can calculate that to some extent I think the major problem with your bounds on your map is that you are keeping sockets in it that no longer exist right mm -hmm. like so so if you follow this logic where when the socket's gone you remove the entry I think there'll be a lot less pressure on your map size. So you won't have to be like, you know, um, this system has a max of 16,000 sockets, but I need a cache size of 64K because I, you know, I'm keeping two, like dead things around in the, in the table for long periods of time, right? Does that make sense? So, so I think like tracking the socket state will maybe not completely solve your math problem, but it'll definitely reduce the pressure on it because you won't have these stale entries in it at, at sort of scale, right? You still have the UDP problem, right? Like you've sort of diverted away from the UDP problem, so we're talking about TCP here, but um, just, a, just a comment, I guess, on your map, on the map pressure. Because when we've done this in other systems before, and then once you do this, your TCP, um, Getting that upper bound on the TCP map is not as hard, right? Right, but I feel like with Martin's suggestion, uh, I, uh, maybe I'm missing something, but we have sidestepped the problem because we already have the tuples in the contract map. It's just that we want to do easy lookups using cache, and for that cache, we're using SK storage. So do we need to duplicate these tuples in another map? I'm not sure we want to <laughs> drag this discussion out here. I, I guess I don't understand why you have to, why you need two caches. Why don't you use this as your contract? Like like divorce the TCP question contract like tuple table hash table thing. Just get rid of that and use the fact that there's a listening socket in the system as your contract decision. Right? You should never receive something that doesn't have a listening socket. So since we do the load balancing, the DNAT, that there is no socket for the tuples that, that we have after translation. So let's go back to this packet And the other problem is also, I mean, for the ingress path, if you're in the host namespace, you need to look up the socket, but you don't know in which network namespace it is, right? Uh, <laughs> because like for the SK lookup, you need the network namespace ID or what it was, I don't know. That's tricky. I think maybe one one other angle on, on on the problem is also like just a tight fakes thing where we have like two entries in a map and we we kind of like when one delete happens we want the other to delete to happen. So this is maybe a slightly different way of looking at the problem. I don't have a solution there, but like I feel like there's a. 
Are if you if there's like a callback or something, so you can, uh, yeah. The request entry is deleted, but not the egress. R right, because because like the the C group storage here is basically saying, hey, here's two things that both need to be cleaned up at the same time, and I, I guess it's awkward to try and store references to the, to the other one in, in each of these, and you don't have a callback to actually delete these things. Like right now, it's iterate through and delete the things that we think are, are stale. So you kind of want the callback, but then that callback hooks onto one of those entries, and when you delete that entry, you need to know about the other entry. So I, I don't know like quite what structure that would map to if you had a generic solution. But. So what, what, what are you, can you go back to the slide for what are you storing in the socket of your storage? Is it the four tuple you are storing in there? Yeah, so we will store the, the, the contract map entry keys in here. So one of them is directly associated with the socket, the other one is the one that Cilium creates to track replies. And that's after service translation. So going back to the slide, so in, it will in store where, in these maybe, tuples. Sorry, uh, so in, in which point you, you don't have the LNS information? That part I, I missed. In no uh, thing or no thing? Is the second entry that we see here in the table, uh, which is when we have translated the service VIP to selected backend IP address. So the 1111 talking to 1112. Hmm. Then how do you, even with socket local storage, how do you do that? Because we don't have, you cannot look up a socket without the DNS ID or something, right? Sorry, can you, can you repeat that? I so even I with the socket local storage, how do you solve that? How, because you cannot look up the socket without the DNS ID. So you must have the mapping somewhere for this designated IP is mapping to that DNS ID. Some so, mapping like that. Yeah, we will continue to use our LRU map to store flow state. The socket storage is, is to assist with uh, efficient GC. I, f I think we need to cut it here because like we are already 15 minutes past um, and it's lunchtime, so I don't want to hold you back from <laughs> lunch. We need to take this into the hallway. Okay, thank you very much, Aditi.